Hi, I'm uh, Jazz Sanguera. I'm branch head of optical materials and devices. Uh, I have about uh, 30 people in my branch and uh, we are uh, very diversified. We're vertically integrated from uh, synthesis of chemicals to materials, science, and making materials, uh, specialty materials, infrared materials, silica fiber optics, optical devices, as well as uh, also design and modeling as well. And uh, behind me just shows you an example of some of the materials that uh, we have developed and are developing and uh, ranging from glasses to ceramics to specialty fibers to uh, thin films, crystals, glasses, glass ceramics and uh, many other types of materials. If you get good at this you can actually make other transparent ceramic materials that are hard to grow via traditional processes and some of those are these uh, ceramic laser materials and these are basically doped with the rare earth iron and the idea is that you pump it and the rare earth iron absorbs the the pump energy gets excited when it relaxes it gives off laser light and these materials the good materials are unfortunately difficult to grow as single crystals and so we can exploit this ceramic process the polycrystalline ceramic process to make those laser materials and we've been successful in doing that in order to do that the key though is you've got to have high quality powder without that you're not going to have a good optical material and so unfortunately again these good quality powders are not commercially available we have to make those so we develop we have clean rooms uh, behind you here whereby we can do that we can actually synthesize high purity chemicals we then utilize those powders in a, and I'll show you a hot press where we hot press those to make transparent ceramic materials and, and these are now laser quality so that we can pump them and we can actually get laser light with efficiencies of 74 percent which are world record high now so this machine basically it's a it's a vacuum furnace vacuum oven but inside there you'll see here piston coming down this way there's one up here so these are the pistons that basically squeeze down and inside I've got a mold my powder is inside the mold and we evacuate, get the gas out of there, raise the temperature to about two-thirds of the melting temperature, and then what happens, the air's gone, so I'm not going to trap any porosity. My powder's coated, so it's all going to uniformly densify. And so by controlling the, the shape of the ends of the pistons, I can control what comes out of there, whether it be a flat window or a conformal optic. And, you know, it's all done within a few hours. This is uh, basically a cluster tool. Uh, some people call it the micro factory, but basically what it's designed to do is to build a device that has multiple uh, layers without ever breaking vacuum. And uh, so the idea is you put in your substrate through the antechamber into the glove box, it goes into a central chamber, and from that point onwards, essentially it's automated. We control uh, and program in where it's going to go, how long it's going to stay there, so how thick a coating, what it's going to be coated on. And so from behind there, there are multiple chambers that lead into that central hub. So this wafer would go into one chamber where we can then sputter up to five uh, different materials in a controlled manner. It goes back into a central section where then it goes to a different chamber where we put another coating such as a buffer layer back in the middle into another chamber where we can put transparent conductors on back into the central chamber back out again into another layer where we into another chamber where we can put a, uh, a metal layer for example and so uh, very uh, it's really important when you're trying to make devices because the interfaces are your weak link uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, pe people typically to put one layer on in, in one machine, to walk over to a different machine, and you contaminate the interface. And we can avoid that by utilizing this machine. So we expect a lot of great things from this in the area of photovoltaics, as well as other materials, meta materials, for example, and uh, and other interesting uh, devices. The infrared I mentioned, the infrared, a lot of action in infrared. Uh, this is beyond two microns. Silica does not transmit beyond two microns as a fiber, and so alternative materials have to be used. And here we develop chalcogenide glasses and fibers. Chalcogenide glasses are based on sulfide and selenide, unlike oxide. And so the, uh, the idea here is that we just get the glass, draw it into fiber, should transmit in the midway. Again, glasses aren't commercially available. 
So we started with the high purity chemicals. We uh, further purify them because they're not good enough quality to use as is. So we further uh, purify in-house, make glasses out of them, melt them into glasses, high purity glasses, and then subsequently draw those into optical fibers. And optical fibers are drawn inside a class 100 clean room, so we avoid contamination from the environment during handling and processing of the glasses into fiber. And the fibers are spooled, and this is just an example of a small spool, but in reality we're drawing hundreds of meters, and in an industry you would be doing scaling up to kilometers and kilometers of the fiber. It's a continuous process. And uh, so this is you know, just a few meters on air. And in practical applications, the fiber is never used bare, it's cabled. And the cabling can be a ruggedized stainless steel or a flexible plastic. Analogous to what's done in silica fiber, and we can do here with these materials. The only difference being that this fiber now transmits beyond two microns, which is not available with silica fiber technology. So it's complementary to silica. Use silica to two, beyond two use these fiber materials. You'll see a lot of spools up there. These are different fibers that we've made. And uh, you know, some just basically allows us to, once we've made these optical materials and devices, to characterize them. And so we, we're, again, uh, fully equipped to uh, characterize these. And what we don't have, we can work with other colleagues at NRL. And if it's not available here, colleagues in industry or university. Uh, and, and we have a lot of collaborations with uh, universities and industry ongoing anyway. NRL is a working capital fund. Basically, it means we're project-based. There is no mission funding, so we're very competitive. We have to go out and, uh, and look for funding, uh, internal as well as uh, you know, external. It's very competitive. Uh, aside from that, there is no money that just comes off a tree to us. We actually, every penny we have to earn. So that's why we have to be at the cutting edge of you know, any technology. Uh, and so we, we, are, we get funded internally, again competitively. Uh, we go to Army, we go to Air Force, uh, DARPA, ONR, you know, wherever there's funding and that we can make an impact with our technology. And uh, so that's really our business model. Once we've got to a point where it's of a certain maturity, you know, obviously not production, but a certain prototype's been demonstrated, then we want to hand it over to industry to crank these out in a manufacturing environment. So we go out there, we talk to our industry colleagues, we nurture that relationship, we bring these people there to our technology transfer department, uh, who then deal with the legal side of things, uh, and then we maintain that relationship with industry. We hold their hands, transition the technology to them, working with them, they come here, we go there, so that's a successful transition.